Imagine with me, and you can close your eyes if you want, but don't fall asleep yet. It's early on in the message. Imagine with me that you booked an appointment at Start Skydiving in Middletown, Ohio. You drove up there, and you went through the classes, and they taught you how to put on your rig and how to pull the cord, and if something went wrong, where the backup cord was that you could pull if you needed to use it, and went through everything you needed, and finally the day arrived, and you boarded the plane and took off into the air, and when you reached an exhilarating 7,000 feet above the ground and everything looked much, much smaller. The door opened with a loud clunk and the instructor ushered you over to the edge and you stood with your toes on the precipice ready to go and the countdown began. Five, four, three, two, one. What would you do? I know what I would do. I would go back into the plane. My legs would turn to jelly and I would be fighting with everything in me not to go out of the plane. I have no desire whatsoever to skydive. As a chaplain in the Air Force Reserves, there's opportunities and people are like, hey, do you want to go up and jump out of a perfectly good plane? And I say, no, thank you. Like I would say to the pilot in that instance, you know what? Consider the money I paid my payment to get me back to the ground in inside of the plane. I bring that illustration up today because I think the feelings associated with it and the idea of turning away from the door and going back into the plane speak to the biblical idea of repentance. If you paid to jump and you changed your mind and you moved in a different direction and said no thank you, there's a sense in which that is biblical repentance. See, biblical repentance is a decisive change change in direction. It's not just a change in thought patterns tied to guilt or remorse. Biblical repentance is a change in our actions. And that's often not how we think of it. If I told you about somebody who changed their mind and decided not to skydive, you might say that they chickened out. You might say that they lacked follow through. You might say that they wasted your money. Uh, but you probably wouldn't say that they repented. That's, that's not how we often use the term. And part of that's tied to the fact that the term gets used primarily in church context. Uh, growing up, in what I would now term as kind of a fundamental Baptist church, my preacher from the time I was six until I was in high school, he ended every sermon the exact same way. He would get to the end of the sermon and in a big booming voice, he would say, now if you go out in the parking lot today and get hit by a bus, where would you go? You need to repent. That led to a big fear on my part of buses. I still will not ride on a bus. I don't want anything to do with buses. But beyond that, that, it it really shaped the way I think of repentance. I think of it as like a feeling of guilt, of remorse. Like when I repent, I feel bad inside. I feel yucky. But as I've studied scripture over the years, and particularly as I've looked at the gospel message, I've come to understand that repentance is so much more than just a, a yucky feeling that we get inside. We've made this point as we've worked through this series on the gospel message in Acts chapter 2. Every time the gospel message is preached, there are four components of it. We see it in Acts chapter 2. We see it in 1 Corinthians 15. We see it throughout the early church. There's always an announcement that the age of fulfillment has arrived. Anytime the gospel is preached, there's an announcement that we are in the last days. That the time from when Jesus came the first time and went back to heaven until the time he's coming again, this is the last days, and we live in this period of the kingdom of God coming, yes, because we can follow Jesus, and yet it hasn't fully arrived yet. And then there's always a summary of the life, the death, and the victory of Christ. There's no gospel message apart from the life of Christ, apart from Jesus coming, living a sinless life, dying dying on the cross and rising from the grave. There's always a teaching that Christian, that that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. That that what God started way back with Abram when he called a guy and he said, hey, I'm going to establish something in you that's going to be a light to all the nations, that all of that that went through the Old Testament and all the Old Testament prophets culminates in the life of Jesus. And then there is always a clear call to repentance. Repentance to turn, to go in a decisively different direction. We see this theme in Peter's first gospel message, and today we come to repentance, which 
probably doesn't excite anybody. Most of us don't really like the idea of talking about repentance. And that's largely because it's tied to sin. And sin has kind of become a word in our culture that we don't really like and we don't really talk very much about. That's because when we talk about sin, we have to admit that we do things that are outside of the will of God. And so we, we kind of brush that under the rug, but when it comes to the Bible, the Bible has no fear talking about sin or repentance. In fact, the word we translate as repent is used over 600 times in the Old Testament alone. As we heard in our scripture reading from Chris, it's brought to the forefront on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of God is given to the people of God and Peter steps up to preach the message that is tied to the hope of God. I want to put the words on the screen for you and we're going to read through this and when we get to those uh, underlined words in yellow, I'm going to have you say them out loud with me. So here goes. Now, when they had heard this, they had heard the gospel message, all that we talked about so far in this series, they were cut to the heart so they had remorse, they had emotion, they had feeling in their heart about what was going on, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, say it with me, ready? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He keeps going. For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. That's us. The, this message is not just for the people listening on that day and age. It's not just for their children who are little, who aren't quite old enough yet. It, it's for us too, for people who are really far away, everyone whom the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, to encourage them, saying, save yourselves from what? from this crooked generation. The, the world that Peter is preaching in is going in one direction, and he is saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. We know from the way they did counting back then that this would have been 3,000 men plus women and children. So the estimates are somewhere around maybe 10,000 people came to know Jesus that day and were baptized. It's a familiar story to many of us, and it's it's tied to that question, what shall we do? It's the most important question we can ask. As a church, we've been in over the course of this year, we started out way back in January looking at the gospel of John and the life of Jesus. And we saw how Jesus presented himself in such a way that we all have a choice to make. He was either a liar who made stuff up, he was a lunatic who had completely lost his mind, or he was Lord. On Easter Sunday, we celebrated the belief that he is Lord and that was proven by the fact that he came out of the tomb, that God empowered him to come back to life. And so when we understand who Jesus is, we ask the question, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And 3,000 plus people did that, but it's not the end of the story. The story doesn't stop there with a the piercing of the heart. The story goes on to those who are far off to us. It's still happening. And to fully understand the implications of what it means to follow Jesus, to fully understand repentance, we've got to keep going. So let's pick back up in verse 42. Again, please read the underlying parts with me. And they devoted themselves, so they committed, they were devoted, they were serious uh, to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Why do we do the things we do as a church? Why do we get together and look at scripture, teaching, what we're doing right now? Why do we fellowship together and spend time together? Why do we break bread, take Christian communion when we get together? Why do we pray together? Because that's what the early church was doing. We we're following in the footsteps of those who have gone before, devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came on every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done throughout the apostles. And read this with me, all who believe were together, and they had all things in common. So they're getting together, they're spending time together, they're gathering together as a church, and they are selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them to the proceeds to all as any had need. And what's this say? Day by day. So every day. 
This is happening over and over. Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes together, they received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Let me just pause there for just a second. There's a chaplain that I serve with in the Air Force, and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, the, the military culture, whenever you ask people, um, when you ask people, hey, how are you doing today? A lot of times people will respond by saying, I'm living the dream. But it's, it's said in like a really cynical way, like, uh, I really hate my life, and so I'm just saying that sort of thing. And there's this one chaplain that I serve with, and he will always respond. And whenever asked, how are you doing, he'll say, I'm favored and blessed. And I just love that concept, that idea that, that we are favored. And notice that when the people of God are doing the things of God, when they're gathering, they're helping each other, they're caring for one another, they're praying, they're putting God first, they're studying the word, like that is the church growth plan. That's, that's how the church begins to move forward. That's how the church expands beyond because this is what happened. Read it with me. And the Lord God added to their number day by day those who were being saved. God is drawing people to himself and the church is continuing to grow. Biblical repentance is a decisive change in direction and it was played out in the actions of the earliest followers of Jesus. They lived out their faith. Next week, we're going to start a sermon series called The Way, in which we're going to look at how they lived out their faith, just kind of step by step through this passage. So I don't want to, I don't want to give away too much today, but I do want you to see that it's a day-by-day -day choice. Every day, the followers of Jesus made a choice to give and to love and to live in a way that was different. Repentance for the early church meant changing direction that changed the way they lived their lives. And that promise has not been rewritten. It's not been taken away. It's for us who are far away. The New Testament word for repentance really kind of communicates this idea of change. It's the word metanoia. You may recognize it. A couple of those words is two words put together. So meta, you may know from like Facebook, meta, the company, and neo. Uh, you may know if you're old enough from neo is the name of a character in the matrix. But those are just words that, that are pulled into our language today. But in the Greek, they simply meant this. Meta Meta means after, and neo means to know or to understand or to think. So metanoia, repentance, is a compound word that simply means to know after or to reconsider. When we repent, we know something now that we didn't know then, and it changes the way we go. When used in the Bible, repentance is a change in mind, and more specifically, it's a change in mind toward one's own sin. Sin is anything we do that goes against the will of God. And when we repent, we change our mind about what sin is and the direction that we're going in. It's kind of a hard message. Because we live in a you-do-you you world. We live in a world in which everybody gets to do whatever they want. It's a popular saying now, oh, you, you go and you do you. But I just like to ask the question, how's that working for us? Like, how's that working out in our world? And I think the answer is it's not working all that well. Things are a mess. Suicide rates are at an all-time high. Personal debt is at an all-time high. The divorce rate is near an all-time high. Actually, the divorce rates come down a little bit because we're not doing well financially. And so there's a lot of people out there when surveyed that say they would get divorced but they can't afford to, which is kind of a sad statement in and of itself. Teen depression numbers are off the charts. Feelings of satisfaction are an all-time low. And I could keep going, but I don't need to tell you what we're already experiencing. Following our own ways, you doing you, is not working out for our culture. It's leaving us in a mess. And that's why Peter, in preaching the first gospel message, presents a different course to change our direction. And here's where it gets personal. In order for us to get there, we have to admit that sin, the problem, the brokenness in the world isn't just a problem out there, but it's a problem in here too. That, that we have our own stuff that we have to deal with. And this change in mind and attitude is multifaceted. First and foremost, repentance involves a hatred of sin. Now, I know that's a strong word. When we repent, we come to a point where we hate our sin, but we get this idea in Peter's gospel sermon. Peter has just went to the Old Testament to show who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, he's the promised Savior of God, and then he says, you crucified him, Jesus who is Lord 
and Christ. They didn't literally crucify him. This, this crowd gathered is not the same crowd that was gathered when Jesus was crucified, but there's a real sense in which they were responsible for the death of Jesus, and there's a real sense in which we are responsible for the death of Jesus. How so? It's because Jesus willingly went to the cross, and he willingly paid the price. And so we have to get to the point where we realize that what held Jesus on the cross was not simply the nails, but was his love for us. We, we have to get to the point where we realize that our sin is the reason Jesus went to the cross. We have this idea in our culture today that we have certain sins that if I do these things, they don't hurt anybody else. And so it's okay for me to do this. I would suggest to you that they do hurt at least one other person, and that other person is Jesus. Every time we do something against the will of God, it's one of the reasons Jesus went to the cross. Now, these feelings of guilt that we have, we often get because we feel yucky when we get our hand caught in the cookie jar. We, we don't like to admit when we do something wrong, and we feel yucky when we do something wrong. I, I learned this at a very young age. I was about six years old. My grandma will always tell this story. Grandma Helderman, she's passed away now. Um, I did something to my brother who was about 18 months older than me. I don't know what I did. I was six. He was about eight. I probably took his toy or bonked him in the head or something. And so we were in in front of grandma, and and, and she was starting to get on me. And as most six-year-olds do, I was giving all of the reasons why it wasn't my fault and why it was actually my brother's fault. And my grandma, who was four foot ten by four foot ten, she knelt down to talk to me. And she kind of got in my face a little bit. And she said, we're not talking about him. We're talking about you and what you have done. To which I crossed my arms and said, okay, fine, grandma. If you want, I will apologize, but I don't mean it. That, that is not biblical repentance. And I think sometimes that's, that's where we're at. We're like, you know, I'm sorry I got caught, but I'm not sorry that I did something wrong. Biblical repentance invites us to get to the point where we hate our sin, where we develop a daily attitude in which we're saying, I do not want to do this because it hurts God. And so I want to stay away from it. And when we develop a hatred for sin, eventually repentance develops a remorse for having broken the will of God. It's an attitude in which we are remorseful for having broken the will of God. It's a state of sorrow and grief. We see this in the Old Testament story of King David. King David starts off really, really well. He's a humble guy. He's the youngest. He's picked and everybody doesn't expect him because he doesn't really look like a king. And yet in his humility, he follows God and he puts his trust in God and he's able to go up and face a giant. All these awesome stories. But then his life kind of goes off the rails. He's not where he's supposed to be. When he's supposed to be, he ends up having an affair. He ends up killing a person. David goes completely in the wrong direction. And the Bible tells us that eventually he is filled with a sense of godly sorrow. In fact, this godly sorrow leads him to write many of the Psalms we have in the Old Testament of the Bible. If you're doing the Read Through the Bible in a Year program with our church family, you have been reading some of those Psalms. And they're deep songs full of David's sorrow about how he has done things to hurt God. This idea of, of godly sorrow comes up in, in 1 Corinthians when Paul says this, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. When we have godly grief, we go to Jesus, we get to a place of salvation and there's not regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. There's a difference in the kind of grief we feel. And some of us spend our entire lives caught in a cycle of worldly grief where we are sorry for what we've done and so we continue to put things in place to hide what we're doing and our brokenness continues to fester. Modern psychologists are calling this moral injury. It's where we have a sense of grief that we live with all the time because we know that we are outside of the will of God and yet we're not willing to change things to come under the authority of God. We're not willing to change our direction and so we live in this sense of grief that crushes us and makes a mess and it leads, as Paul says here, to death. 
I have a story about some worldly grief that I experienced when I was a sophomore in high school. I was trying to think this week, like, what's the time that I felt really bad about something I did and, and a time that I really got myself into a mess? So when I was a sophomore in high school, I had a friend, and I said I was going to spend the night at my friend's house. My friend said he was going to spend the night at my house, and we so forth, so on. Some of you all have, have, have done this, right? Maybe not. You're not as bad as I was. So long story short, it ended up there was a whole group of us high school friends who were out in a field goofing around at about one in the morning with some high-powered BB guns. The result of that was one of my other friends had a car and we shot out the window of the car. Now it was the back passenger side of the window that we shot with the BB gun and it blasted through the window and so we realized godly or not godly worldly grief. We realized oh man we're in trouble. We're going to get caught now because there's no way of explaining this. So in our 10th grade wisdom, we came up with what we thought was a really good story. We told Steve, go home and tell your dad you were driving down the road and a rock hit the window of the car. Because a lot of rocks bounce up and hit the back passenger side window of the car, right? Totally believable. And a lot of rocks apparently are perfectly round and exactly the size of a BB. What we didn't realize because we were freaking out was that actually the BB was still stuck in the back seat of the car. And so Eddie, the dad, it was not real hard for him to figure out that our story was not the most accurate of stories unless we just happened to hit a floating BB that was out there. And it still didn't answer the question of what we were doing at one in the morning with BB guns in the first place. And so we had this sense of remorse, and my dad, unfortunately, he did not get that memo about spare the rod, spoil the child. And so whenever he got the phone call in the morning, my world kind of crumbled down around me, and it led to death. Not really, but um, as a 10th grader in high school, I thought it was going to lead to death for a few minutes, I'll tell you that. I point that out to say this. You know, when we hear stories like that, we say, ah, that's just stories of teenage disobedience. And there's a sense in which, yes, that's kind of the truth. But it's also a story of rebellious and broken hearts. See, the reality is that I was lying to my parents and I knew better. And the reality is that Jesus died for rebellious teenage hearts like mine and for each of us. Biblical repentance means accepting remorse and saying, you know what, I'm sorry not that I just got caught in this situation that's a situation of lies and brokenness, but I'm sorry that I should have never been there in the first place because I'm trying to live life outside of the parameters that God put in place. And when we start to understand biblical repentance, eventually repentance increases the desire to get rid of sin. A decisive change in direction leads to a change in which we say, I don't want stuff in my life that gets between me and God. Theologian Wayne Grudem says, a sincere commitment to forsake sin and walk in obedience to Christ is part of following him. When we repent, we eventually get to the point where we desire to sin less and to honor God more. When we repent, we admit that it's not about our performance, but it's about what Jesus did, and we are forgiven, and we are accepted, and so we live in light of that, and we change because of that. It's not about guilt. Because guilt just is debilitating. Guilty people are surrounded by the walls of shame and sorrow, but hopeful people walk out of that shame and sorrow and instead realize that they can live with Jesus as Lord. And I think that this freedom that's tied to true biblical repentance and change of direction is why repentance is so often tied to baptism. Let me put the words on the screen again for you of what Jesus says. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized, we die to our old way of life, and we raise to a new life with Christ. We die to the life we could have lived, and we raise ourselves to a new life, a new direction with Jesus as king. It can be likened to a caterpillar and a butterfly. We, we emerge as a new creation in Christ Jesus that there is a decisive change in direction. As we've worked our way through this liar, lunatic, and Lord series at the beginning of the year, and we've seen that Jesus is Lord, we come to the point where we say, okay, if he is Lord, then it changes the way I live my life in big ways and small ways, and I die to the old way that I was living, and I raise 
to a new life with Christ as my king. Sometimes I think we think of this in big monumental ways, but I know for me personally, I've experienced it in just pragmatic everyday living. My kids and my wife will tell you that through my late 20s and early 30s, I was a very angry person. I would get mad at things very, very quickly. Um, Unfortunately for my family, it was like living with a ticking time bomb. You never knew when I was going to blow up and what was going to upset me. Uh, People who know me now say, "I I just can't imagine that you were like that, but it's really the way that I was wired and the way that I was behaving. Um, But God, thankfully, through the power of the Holy Spirit, worked in my life and brought me to a very different place. And my wife was reflecting on that this week. On Tuesday, I was here at the church. I was working on my sermon about three o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. And I got a phone call from my daughter, Lydia. And uh, she was upset on the other end of the line. And I I couldn't figure out what was going on. I'm like, where's mom? And she's like, well, mom's not available. And I'm like, where's she at? And, And she probably wouldn't want me telling you this, but she was just in the bathroom. You know how hard it is for moms to go to the bathroom? bathroom. Like they can just never get like five minutes to themselves. And I'm like, well, what's going on? Long story short, we were getting a retaining wall put in at our house and the landscape guy was getting ready to leave. And we live on South Cross in Thornwild. Some of you are familiar with it. And, um, and there was a school bus coming down the road. And so the guy backing out decided he was going to beat the school bus. And so he floored it to beat the school bus and he backed right into the side of our van and totally smashed it in the side of our van. Now, we have three vehicles. One of them's 22 years old. One of them's 15 years old. And then our van's like four years old. Of course, they always hit the new one, right? It's like, hey, could you go back in the driveway, let me move vehicles, and then do it again? Because this is the one that I really want hit. But it never quite works out that way. And, and the Nathan of 10 years ago, I, I would have lost my mind. I would have been very upset by the situation. But God has taught me something about forgiveness. The more I've walked with Jesus, Jesus, the more I've come to reflect on how much he has forgiven me of, and so it allows me to be much more forgiving in my daily life and to say, you know what, I know you didn't do this on purpose. It's just an accident. Yes, it's an aggravation. Yes, we have to deal with it now and get the van fixed, and it's in the shop for the next couple of weeks and all that stuff, but it's not the end of the world, and, and, and it's really more important that I act in a way that reflects Jesus in this moment and not in a way that reflects my own anger and my own wanting justification and, and getting mad and all those other things that used to be a part of how I lived. It's going to be okay. See, when we follow Jesus in big ways and in small ways, it begins to change us because repentance moves us in a different direction. We have an example of someone who had an opportunity to repent, but just had worldly guilt and not actual godly repentance in the story of Judas. And you may recall the story of Judas. He was one of the 12 followers of Jesus. He walked with Jesus, and he was right there with Jesus all throughout his ministry. And at the end, he made a major mistake. He betrayed Jesus, and he was paid 30 pieces of silver for that. And the Bible tells us that he felt something, that he had some godly, not godly, worldly remorse. And he went back to the temple, and he threw his 30 coins in there, and he said, I'm really sorry for what I did. He, he had a sense of sorrow, and And yet he went on from there to go out and to hang himself. Literally, it led to death, as Paul would say, that that worldly guilt. Instead of turning to Jesus and going to him for forgiveness, he made a different choice. See, the guilt of the world is oppressive and it hangs on us like a dark blanket. And yet when we come to Jesus and we accept what it means to be forgiven, when we repent and move in a different direction, our life changes. So can I ask you a question? What would it look like for you to make a decisive change in direction? What would it look like for you to admit your sin? What would it look like for you to, uh, to cultivate a desire to get rid of your sin? What would it look like for you to turn to God? That may look a lot of different ways. It could look like Christian baptism. We had a baptism at the end of first service today. It was really neat. Cole Stuber is a young man here in our church, and he made the decision to follow Jesus with his life. And he came in here, and and he died to the life that he could live, and he raised again to walk with Jesus. And it was really a beautiful thing to be able to see and to be a part of. And the more we follow Jesus, the more we start to develop an attitude that wants to get 
sin out of our lives and move in a direction that is pleasing to him. I was reading this week, and it's an age-old debate about whether or not repentance is a part of the good news. People have been talking about this for 2,000 years. There are some theologians that say, no, repentance is not a part of the good news because the good news is the good news. And if you put something bad into the good news, then it's no longer the good news anymore. But there are other people that say, well, you have to have some bad news or you don't have any good news. If there's not something to turn from, there's not something to turn to. And so there's pages and pages written about about, you know, is repentance a part of the good news or is it in front of the good news or how does it all fit? And, and what I find is sometimes I think I'm just rather simple. At the end of the day, this is what I've come to conclude is this, that acceptance of the gospel does include repentance, which is a decisive change in direction. When we accept the good news, we repent and we change the direction in which we are moving with our lives. There is a change in direction. If you've believed this truth, I want to encourage you to keep going. I have a friend who says, none of us stay still. And I find that to be very, very true. There's a temptation, I think, to believe that we walk with Jesus for long enough and we eventually get to a point and we're like, I'm just going to stay here for a while. There's, there's parts of my life, God, I don't want you to mess with. There's things that we're just going to pretend like they're not there, and I just want to stay here. And we have this illusion that we can just remain in a place, but it doesn't work like that. We're either moving towards God, we're either repenting and moving in a decisive direction towards Jesus, or the culture and the current of the world and the enemy is attacking, and we are moving away from God. And so there has to be a choice made. Biblical repentance invites us to develop a hatred of sin because sin breaks the heart of God. 3,000 people were pierced to their heart, but that didn't stop there. They went on from there to live life differently. They went on from there to give and to love and to serve in different ways because of what Jesus had done. There was a decisive change in direction. Turning from sin and turning toward Christ. A desire to move away from selflessness and rebellion, to move towards mercy and forgiveness and guidance. And so I just want to encourage you today, if you're on the path, if you're moving towards Jesus and, and you sense, man, I, I just have some areas of my life where I need to do some changing, that I need to invite God into these places, I need to start moving in a different direction, keep it up, keep moving in the direction that leads towards godly sorrow, the direction of godly sorrow that leads towards salvation, that leads towards Jesus. Make a decisive change in direction. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to empower you and move forward. Together, we can move towards who God has created us to be, and we can walk out of lives of sin and shame and guilt, and we can walk into lives of freedom and hope empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the gospel message. Thank you for both being Lord and being Christ. May you develop in each of us a greater attitude of repentance. May you soften our hearts so that we hate sin and we love doing your will. May you break the strongholds of darkness in our lives. May you empower us through your spirit to decisively follow you. God, I pray as a church and as a people that we continue to move in a different way direction with you as our King. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.